What is up everybody? This is Mike with Tiny Life Big Mission and this week in the Word we are studying the distinct baptisms found in the Bible. Grab your Word of Truth and let's jump in. Welcome to This Week in the Word, where this segment of the channel focuses on a weekly Bible study where we share truth based on what the Word of God says. If you have questions about God or you are seeking truth, I want to welcome you, and I thank you all for joining today. I hope that this video is a good resource for your personal studies. As we continue our investigative study on doctrine, we are in a series called Questions on Rightly Dividing. This week's study, we will be covering what baptism is, why it is important, as well as the different and distinct baptisms spoken of in Scripture. Just as a reminder, this video, along with others like it, have been grouped into a playlist called Questions on Rightly Dividing that can be found under our playlist tab on our channel's main page. If you're new to the channel or are interested in understanding more about our position, please check out our quick reference video on our five guiding principles. I'll link that in the top corner up here. In this series, I am featuring one question per week from the questions that I've been asked by viewers during the Rightly Dividing series. This week's question comes from, well, a question that I had early on in my journey of right division. This question was about the Great Commission. How are Christians supposed to follow the Great Commission from Jesus, which is to go forth and teach all nations, baptizing them? When Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, as our example, says that Jesus sent him not to baptize. So, are we sent to baptize or not? Baptism is a major topic in right division, even though most people who claim they follow right division don't even realize. All believers will agree that baptism needs to be done, but as soon as you start asking specifics, everything seems to blow up. This topic is arguably one of the most explosive and fought over doctrines in the Bible, and there are all kinds of line in what each believer thinks about this subject. But the truth of what the Bible says about baptism may shock you, and that's what we're going to cover in this study. This will most likely be the last video that I do in this series, or at least for now. I may add more if I get more questions in the future. But I've been saving this study for the last in the series because it ties all the principles of right division together in a way that only God's Word can do. Rightly dividing the baptism in the Word of God clears up all the confusion on the subject and gives clarity to how the Word is divided. There are a lot of questions, opinions, and polarized teachings about the word baptism. This word and what is believed about it has caused more denominational divisions than any other single doctrine of Christianity. There is so much division over this word. Some will think that water baptism is required for salvation. Others think that it is uh, some kind of requisite for uh, a membership or acceptance or enlightenment. Others teach it as the first step in obedience or discipleship. Some believe that the church practice should be immersion, completely dunking people under, while other people believe that you could pour over and some even sprinkle. Some believe that baptism should be done in the name of Christ. Some believe that it should be done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And others say it should be done in the name of his death, burial, and resurrection. Some believe that infants need to be baptized while some will say that it is only for believing adults, and others believe in proxy baptisms for the dead. Most believe that all baptisms involve water, and in just hearing the word, your brain automatically assumes water, yet others see different forms of baptism in the scripture. Some believe that true baptism is only real when it is administered by the authority of a local church. Some believe that it must be performed by someone who is ordained, and yet others believe it can be performed by anyone because it's a condition of the heart. All this is to say that there is a lot of varying perspectives on this topic, and despite how many different views there are, people tend to hold their view as the only true way without even considering their odds of being wrong. With all the variables that we just covered, statistically you are more likely to be wrong than right. The reason most people hold their view is because they believe they have scripture to support their belief, and as we go through this study, I want you to ask yourself, what does the scripture actually say. For those of you who have followed me for any amount of time know that I teach that there is no need for the Bible believer today to study Greek today. 
Not saying that it's wrong or that it can't be helpful, it's just not necessary. This study is a great example of how men use their intellect of the Koine Greek over what the Word of God says to make a mess of the Bible. If you have God's Word inspired and preserved in English, then there is no need to go to the Greek to get a better understanding. Study the text in the context of how it is being used in English, and the Bible will always define its meanings through the context. I digress, that's not the point of this video. Now, to best understand the word baptism, we need to first realize that this word is a transliteration, not a translation. A transliteration is a word that doesn't have a translation equivalent in the language that you are translating it to. So you are essentially creating a word in the language that you are translating this word into by making a spelling equivalent for the new word into the new language. You can see how the English word baptism is spelled the exact same as the Greek word using the equivalent of each letter. Yeah, I've got that kind of down there for you to look at. The new word carries the meaning of the same word that you are transliterating, but it's not as easy as it sounds because transliterations are trying to convey the meaning of a word that the new language has no word for. Now with the word baptism, this problem of transliteration is further complicated because as English developed, you had men who were trying to redefine this word to support their belief of what this word means. And that is where this whole mess begins. So in every dictionary, or at least all that I have referenced, you will see this word baptism defined in a number of ways, but regardless of the variation of definition, all of them use this word water as part of their definition. And most of the time you see an emphasis on dunking, plunging, or submerging. And I don't know about you, but that is what I was taught in church, and this is the teaching that I trusted for a very long time. Now, I'm not saying that these definitions are wrong because they can match how the word is used in context in some instances. But none of these definitions fit the context of how the Bible uses this word in every instance that the Bible uses it. The reason I teach we do not need to go to the Greek is because the Bible is a supernatural book that always defines the words that it uses based on the context of how it uses them. So the way the Bible defines the word baptism is based on how it is used in the context, and that is to identify with. Biblically, baptism is an act of placing one's self into an association. It is distinguishing yourself or connecting yourself or submitting yourself to a person or group. You can use that definition for every use of the word baptism found in the Bible and it will work in every occurrence. Now there's more that I can dive into on this, but for the sake of time we really need to keep moving. But the big takeaway from this point is to comprehend that baptism is an action that establishes an identity or association. This word is not a wet word, nor does it have anything to do with water as part of its definition. It does not mean to dunk, to plunge into water as we've all been taught that it means. And you will see this as we work through this study. Now, that being said, baptism can be connected to water, but that is based on the context of how it is used, not the meaning or definition of it. In the New Testament, the word baptism and all variations of it are found 116 times all of which are used to speak about the action of identifying oneself with a person or group. There are seven distinct baptisms or types of identification that can be found in Scripture. Now, of these 116 uses, the vast majority are used to speak about the baptism made with water. But that baptism is the only baptism in the Bible that uses water. Well, arguably there are two baptisms that use water, and we'll get into that later. So because of most of the uses of this transliteration are connected to water, assumptions are made that the meaning of this word itself is connected to water. If you have been taught this and believe this, I ask you to hear me out and watch the whole video before you just write me off. I will demonstrate this from scripture for you. So some good questions to ask yourself is why is baptism matter so much? And should believers be fighting so strongly over this topic? And more importantly, where does the Bible demonstrate or support this fight? Most who will support water baptism for believers today do it from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the Apostle Paul, who is the Apostle to the Gentiles, said in 2 Timothy 2.7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Have you considered what Paul has to say about baptism? 
I mean, if this practice is such a big deal, I'm sure that Paul has something to say about it. Have you searched that out? Have you considered what he has to say? I'm sure he gave us instructions on it so that we don't fight over it, and that's what we're going to look at in this study. I want to give you a little spoiler alert. In this study, you will learn that the only baptism in the Bible that involves water is John the Baptist's baptism, and it is called the baptism of repentance, and it is connected to prophecy. Now, John the Baptist was a prophet, and it was prophesied that he would come before Messiah. You can see this in Matthew 3, 1 through 3. These prophecies are found in Malachi 3 and Isaiah 40. And all this lines up with John 1.31, where it says that the reason John baptized with water was for the purpose of manifesting the Messiah to Israel. Every gospel opens with the story of John the Baptist. And in every gospel, John is recorded as telling the Jews that he, John the Baptist, came baptizing with water, but there was one who would come after him that was before him, and he will baptize them with the Holy Ghost. John was prophesied to baptize, and Jesus was prophesied to baptize. John with water, and Jesus with water and the Holy Ghost. It's not the point of this study, but just for something for you to consider, and this may trigger some of you, but please don't let your emotions get the best of you. Just hear me out. There's more biblical precedence for water baptism by means of pouring over than there is for submersion. I know there was a time in my life where I wouldn't have heard that for a second. I would have shut it down, but consider this. There is not one passage that says that John baptized in water. Every pa passage says that he baptized with water. And when it speaks about Jesus baptizing with the Holy Ghost, the Bible says with in every passage as well. There is not one that says in the Holy Ghost. In Acts 2.17, when Peter is quoting the prophecy found in the book of Joel, he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. This prophecy is speaking about the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Being baptized with the Holy Ghost was a pouring out of the Holy Ghost. So being baptized with water would likely be a pouring out of water. This scripture uses the same language, and we are supposed to compare scripture with scripture. Again, don't be defensive about it. Just consider it. Personally, I don't have an opinion one way or the other if it's more important to dunk or to be poured over. It's just something for you to consider for yourself. And you may be thinking to yourself that the representation of burial is where submersion comes from. Uh, there are only two verses that can be used to support that, and those are Romans 3.6 and Colossians 2.12. The problem is that neither of those passages are speaking about water baptism. People read water into those passages based on what they've been taught that the word baptism means, but we'll cover all that a little bit later. Okay, so that was a little bit of a rabbit trail that wasn't really related to our main point, but even from that rabbit trail, you can see that water baptism is connected to prophecy in the coming kingdom. Additionally, in Acts 8.36, we see the Ethiopian eunuch say that here is water. What is hindering me from being baptized? Did you ever wonder what he was reading in the scroll of the prophet Isaiah in verse 30 that made him ask that? In John 1.25, when the Pharisees were questioning John the Baptist about what he was doing with uh, baptizing people in water, they asked him if he was the Christ. And John said, no. So they asked him, well, if you aren't the Christ, why are you baptizing people with water? This shows that both the Pharisees and the eunuch knew that there was this connection between Messiah and water based on prophecy. The scripture that told this to the Pharisees is the same scripture that told it to the Ethiopian eunuch, which is Isaiah 52, verse 3 through 15. Anyways, I went a little bit deeper on all this than what was necessary, but the point is to show that water baptism is connected to prophecy, and in right division, prophecy is divided from mystery. So in this study, we are going to go through the seven distinct baptisms found in Scripture. There are some who teach that there are more, and even though I don't see those distinctions, I really don't care to argue about it. The main issue to me is that there's more than one baptism. There's more than just water baptism spoken of in scripture. We're going to cover a lot of Bible today, so grab your Bible, uh, any preferred method for taking notes, and feel free to pause as needed as we go along here. Uh, we will go in the order of when each baptism occurred in the timeline of the Bible, starting all the way back in the time of Moses. Now this first baptism in the Bible is called the baptism unto Moses. 
Now, even though this baptism took place during the Exodus, it is actually recorded in the scriptures in the book of 1 Corinthians. So let's go ahead and start by just reading our text. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. And it's funny how every time Paul says that he doesn't want us to be ignorant, that seems to be a subject that most Christians today are ignorant of. I would not have that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. This baptism was a dry baptism. None of the children of Israel got wet. In fact, those who were immersed or submerged in water were Pharaoh and the Egyptians and they all died. The Bible records this in Exodus 14. So let's just take a real quick look at that because I want you to see that it is dry. Exodus 14, 27 through 29. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. So none of the children of Israel got wet. The Bible is very clear about this point in multiple verses. Now it's clear to see from the scriptures that this is a distinct baptism from the water baptism that is taught in churches today. No one can have this baptism today. And as we look at each of these baptisms, I will show you who the baptism pertains to, the exclusivity of it, as well as the results of the baptism or who the identification was, was made to and from. This baptism exclusively pertains to the children of Israel who were led out of Egypt and wandered in the wilderness. The results of this baptism was the children of Israel were identified with Moses and the Lord who led them both in the pillar of the cloud. The context clearly shows the meaning of this word baptism when it says that they were baptized unto Moses. They were all identified unto Moses as followers of him. They were not dunked in water to follow him. The second baptism mentioned in the Bible timeline is called the baptism of repentance. This baptism is going to take a minute to work through because it is a water baptism as well as the most spoken of baptism in scripture and the combination of those two facts have led men to make a mess of it. So the video may go a little bit long because of this, but it's worth it, trust me. Let's start by reading our text, which is Matthew 3, 1 through 6. Now this is the first mention of any variation of the word baptism found in scripture. And in this chapter, this word or some variation of it is used eight times. Let's go on ahead and read verse one. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now I know this passage did not call this baptism by name, but here are three passages that all call it by the same name, and you can clearly see in the context that they are speaking about the baptism of John the Baptist. Mark 1 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Luke 3 3 says, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Acts 13 24 says, when John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. This shows us who taught it and who it was to and what it was for. This baptism of repentance that John the Baptist preached was preached of Jesus and Peter as well. It is a water baptism. This baptism also is referred to as John the Baptist's baptism in scripture. Mark 11:30 says the baptism of John was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. And Luke 20 is kind of a replication of that same event. Acts 1:22 Beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. 
Acts 19.3, And he said unto them, Unto what then are ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. This is the first baptism that Jesus was baptized with. We'll talk a little bit more about both Jesus' baptism in this video, but not only was Jesus baptized with this, but those who followed Jesus were baptized with this same baptism as well. We see that in John 4, 1 and 2, which says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, it was the same baptism as John. Jesus' group just did it more. So the apostles were baptizing people and making disciples during Jesus' earthly ministry, but that didn't end when Jesus ascended into heaven. Baptism was part of what the disciples were commanded to do as part of being sent out on their great commission. In the book of Acts, we see the disciples, the apostles, doing what they were commissioned to do by baptizing people with this baptism. Let me show you a couple references real quick. All these verses are from when Jesus sent out his disciples with their great commission. Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Mark 16, 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And these are some examples of Jesus' apostles following their great commission after his ascension. Acts 8.12 says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The cross-reference between these passages in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts clearly show that what is being preached is the gospel of the kingdom, which is to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And in that gospel, the baptism is the baptism of John the Baptist. All of this pertains to the kingdom being offered to the Jews. It is the gospel of the kingdom, and if you study it out, you will find that this gospel requires believing in Jesus as the Christ or Messiah, a confession of sin, repentance of sin, water baptism, and keeping commandments. It is very different from the gospel of grace. Yet every denomination today tries to interweave parts of the kingdom gospel into the gospel of grace and brands it as Christianity. People who want to require water baptism today will try to say that Paul preached baptism and even baptized people himself. The closest that you can get in the Bible to Paul teaching water baptism is Acts 19. But take caution here because Acts is a transitionary book written by Luke. This book shows how God led men through the transition from the kingdom gospel to the mystery gospel. But even in Acts 19, Paul never instructs or teaches any believer that they need to be water baptized. Paul just told them what John the Baptist taught, and when they heard it, they were like, yes, and then Paul baptized them. And in this passage, you can see how sign gifts to the apostles were still in effect. So turn to Acts 19, and let's look at what it actually says. Acts 19, 2 through 6. He said unto them, that's Paul, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him that should come after him, that's what we just talked about and went over, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. In this passage, Paul didn't baptize them with water, but that is what is read into this passage. We will talk about this passage more in the next baptism. But even though the book of Acts shows Paul's baptizing people, it never said that Paul used water or that he was even near water. Furthermore, it is noteworthy that the book of Acts does not show Paul preaching the gospel of grace. This is because it is a transitionary book written by Luke. Jesus didn't reveal the gospel of grace to Luke, so it was not for Luke to reveal it 
first in the canon of Scripture. There are differences from what Luke writes about Paul in the book of Acts and what Paul writes in his epistles. Paul never preached baptism of repentance in any of his epistles. Paul never spoke about the kingdom being at hand, confessing sins, or the remission of sins. Nor is there one instruction from Paul for us to repent as part of salvation. Additionally, some men will try to justify water baptism to believers by saying that Paul was even baptized himself and he is our example. Again, I want you to look at what the words say. If you read Acts 9, 17 through 19, you will see that there is no water stated. Grab your Bible and open it to Acts 17 and read this for yourself. Water is read into it and even I have read water into it. But the more I study this passage, the more I see a case to be made that Paul was baptized with the Holy Ghost and not with water. Ananias came into the house where Paul was at. He put his hands on Paul and said that Jesus had sent him to Paul so that Paul could receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He didn't say anything about baptizing him in water. Then the Bible says that immediately Paul received his sight and arose and was baptized. It never even suggests that he left the house or went down to the river or anything like that. It just says that he arose and was baptized, meaning that when he stood up, he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. Paul never speaks about being baptized in any of his epistles. If baptism is important and he is our pattern, why didn't he tell us about his? So I think it could be that when he received his sight, he also received immediately the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The scripture is not 100% clear either way, but let's just say for argument's sake that Paul was water baptized in Acts 9.18. This baptism wasn't part of what Jesus set Ananias to do as seen in verse 17, and this baptism would have taken place before Paul's ministry began during the transition and before Jesus gave Paul the complete revelation of the dispensation of grace. So you can see this by comparing Acts 9 and Galatians 1, that it still would not be anything to do with the body of Christ. Paul never taught anything about water baptism in any of his epistles except for one time in 1 Corinthians 1. Now, this is the only place where Paul talks about water baptism, so pay attention and take notes on what he says. Let's read this really quick. It's found in verse 11 through 17. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. It's funny, there's still contentions amongst the brethren about baptism today. <laughs> Things don't change. Verse 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, that's Peter, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you. That's an interesting statement. But Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Beside, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. In verse 14, Paul starts his only recorded teaching about water baptism by saying that he thanks God that he baptized none of them. Why would Paul say that if water baptism was important for the body of Christ? Paul tells us to run our race to win. So if baptism numbers mattered, why is he glad that he didn't do it? Then Paul backs up by listing this list of exceptions of people that he did baptize but then comes back and says that Jesus did not send him to baptize. It is black and white that water baptism is not part of what was revealed for the body of Christ. So there is either a contradiction in what Paul is saying here in the Bible, or Paul did not preach water baptism. And we know that there's no contradictions in the Bible. Now, I know I went a little bit deep into this baptism, but it's very important to see who this baptism is to, and even more importantly, who it is not to. So, back to the baptism of, unto repentance. This baptism pertains to prophecy, the nation of Israel, and it's for the kingdom of heaven. The result of this baptism is to identify with Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, for the remission of sins.
The third baptism found in Scripture is the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Now, just to be clear, the Holy Ghost is not made of water, so this is another dry baptism. Let's go on ahead and read the text. This is John the Baptist speaking in Mark 1.8. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he, that is Jesus, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. This verse shows that being baptized with the Holy Ghost is different than being baptized with water. You can see the separation with the word but. This baptism is also connected to prophecy. I don't have time to run out all the references, but in Luke 7, Jesus says that there is no greater prophet than John the Baptist. And in this verse, John is prophesying about the Holy Ghost. Acts 2 also shows how the Holy Ghost is poured out according to the prophecy of Joel. This brings us back to where uh, some people will try to say that Paul was baptized with water. Um, so go on ahead and turn back to Acts 19 and we'll read that one more time. He said unto them, that's Paul speaking, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? So the context here in this passage is receiving the Holy Ghost. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? Paul was assuming that they had been baptized with the Holy Ghost, and when he learns that they don't even know what he's talking about, he asks, Then what baptism did you have? Paul understood that there was more than one kind of baptism, and they answered him with, John's baptism, that is John the Baptist, which as we have already studied is a water baptism. It's the baptism unto repentance. Let's keep reading in verse 4. Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So if the both of the baptisms here that he's talking about are water baptisms, he basically asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost? They said, no, we didn't know what it was. So he says, what were you baptized unto? And they said, unto John's baptism. So Paul tells them that John baptized with the baptism of repentance. And when they heard it, they were baptized with water again. That doesn't even make sense. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. I don't see anywhere in here where Paul takes them out and dunks them in water, but that is what gets read into this scripture. But it's not what it says. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they were filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Just like when Ananias was sent from Jesus to lay his hands on Paul, and Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts 9. Now, I know I just covered that super fast, and it's not the point of this study, so I can't really dive further into it. I have to keep moving, but the point of it is just to demonstrate that different baptisms in the Bible are made distinct. You can see differences. The gift of the Holy Ghost is a baptism that was given to the Jews as a sign, as the last offering of the kingdom, and it pertains to the Jews, prophecy, signs, and the kingdom. This baptism results in identifying with the believing remnant, the little flock, and the Messiah that was promised for the kingdom. The fourth baptism is the baptism with fire. This can be found in several verses, but we will read it from Luke 3.16. This is a very unique verse because it features three different baptisms all in one verse, but only one of them is a water baptism. Let's go on ahead and read it now. Luke 3.16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoe I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. This is not water baptism. In fact, I don't think you can get more polar opposite from water than fire. There are some denominations that teach that this baptism is a good thing. They will connect it to the day of Pentecost and the gift of tongues where in Acts 2.3 it says the, the cloven tongue appeared unto them like as of fire and sat upon each of them. And that is taking it way out of context. The baptism of fire is not a good baptism. It is a baptism of judgment for the unbelievers. We see this in the context of where we just read uh, in verse 17, where it explains this baptism a little further. It says that the chaff, which is representing the unbelieving, are burned with fire fire. 
Jesus speaks to the Jews a good bit about this baptism in different parables that he used in his ministry. This baptism pertains to the unbelieving Jews who did not believe in their Messiah, those branches that are cut off and thrown into the fire. It is connected to prophecy and the future kingdom. The result of this baptism identifies all unbelievers with the judgment of God. The fifth baptism in scripture is the baptism of Jesus. This is mentioned in all four gospels, but we'll read it from Matthew 3. Verse 13 through 17 says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This was a water baptism, but technically it's the same baptism of repentance that John the Baptist preached. This was spoken of in the scriptures by the law and prophets, and as part of the kingdom being offered, Jesus needed to participate because he was under law. The reason that this baptism is separated on its own as it's uh, a distinct baptism is because it pertains exclusively to Jesus. Nobody else in the history of the world was baptized, and when they came out of the water was the voice of God present that said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, nor was there the lighting of a dove coming down from heaven. This is exclusive for Jesus. Jesus' baptism with the baptism unto repentance had nothing to do with Jesus needing to confess sin or to repent because Jesus had no sin. And it's because Jesus had no sin that this baptism was necessary. John didn't understand this, so he told Jesus, you don't need to be baptized by me, but rather I need to be baptized by you. But by being baptized with this baptism, Jesus was able to fulfill all righteousness. This identification associated Jesus with man's sin so that he could bear them. The result of this baptism was identifying Jesus with the sins of man while fulfilling the law and prophecy, proving that Jesus was the promised Messiah, inaugurating Jesus' earthly ministry. In Galatians 4.4, 4, it says that Jesus was born under the law to redeem those under the law. And that's why right after this, you see Jesus uh, going up into the wilderness where Satan comes and tempts Jesus. And the reason why is because Satan knew that with this identification to sin, that Jesus would be the most vulnerable to sin. Jesus experienced and took on all the sin of the world, yet he himself did no sin. That is how he was able to pay for the sins of the world. This is a distinct and very important baptism. The sixth baptism in scripture is the baptism unto suffering. This baptism is recorded in three of the gospels, but we will read it from Matthew 20, 22. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. Now I also threw in this cross-reference from Luke to help explain what this baptism is about. And you can read it further if you want. But Luke 12:50 says, But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Now these verses record Jesus talking about a baptism that he was going to be baptized with. And this is clearly after he was already baptized with water. So it, this is not talking about that. This is not a water baptism. And we saw from the cross reference in Luke, if you look at that further, you'll see that this is a baptism that is connected to the suffering that Jesus knew that he was going to face on the cross. But this baptism is not about Jesus' suffering alone. It's not exclusive to Jesus because Jesus told the sons of Zebedee that they would take part in this baptism too. This baptism pertains to Jesus and to all the apostles. The result of this baptism was to identify with the humility of servant leadership and as ministers of Christ to give their life a ransom for many. The seventh and final baptism recorded in the scripture is the baptism into death. This could also be called the baptism into Christ or the baptism of the body 
or even the believer's baptism. Now, I will caution that calling it the believer's baptism because most denominations have taught that the believer's baptism is a water baptism and that it's for those who have truly believed in Jesus. And, and if you have truly believed in Jesus, you must do the believer's baptism. But that's that's all going beyond scripture. The believer's baptism, there's only one of them, and it, it happens the moment of salvation, and you'll see that here in just a second. The reason I call it the baptism into death is because that is what the Bible calls it in Romans 6. Let's go on ahead and read that now. Romans 6, 3 through 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in newness of life. Most Christian teachers today will try to weave together the water baptism of repentance and the baptism with the Holy Ghost with this baptism so that they can justify the requirement for water baptism. But for the believer who is under grace, there is only one baptism that is necessary, and it is not a water baptism. The baptism of repentance, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and the baptism into death are all distinct baptisms. The baptism unto death is a spiritual baptism that happens the moment that you believe the gospel of the grace of God. This baptism is by one spirit, not with one spirit. There's a distinction between the two of those words in scripture, and that's important to see. And it is the only baptism that is part of the salvation by grace. There's only one, and I'll show you this from scripture. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 4, it says, for as the body is one, it's talking about the body of Christ, and there's only one body of Christ, and it hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Talking about the body of Christ, and it's by one spirit that we are all baptized. That's the only baptism that matters. And how do we know it's the only baptism that matters? Ephesians 4, 4 and 5 says so. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism right there, plain as day, black and white. There's only one baptism for those who are in the body of Christ. It is a spiritual baptism that happens by the Spirit of God the moment that you believe the gospel of grace. The baptism into death pertains to those who join the body of Christ. The result of this baptism is that all believers are identified with the work that Christ did. We are identified with his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's only by this baptism that we can receive forgiveness from all sins through justification by God. It is dying to ourself and to sin to live in Christ as part of his body. The Bible says that this baptism unites all believers into one body, and it's clearly not water baptism. Now, as far as water baptism goes, there's only one water baptism in the Bible, and it is the baptism unto repentance. This baptism is connected to signs, prophecy, and the offering of the kingdom. Wrongly dividing the word of truth leads to a focus and requirement for water baptism, which just causes division. This takes us back full circle to all those opinions of practice and belief that I spoke to in the beginning of this video. When you understand the different baptisms in the Bible and who they pertain to, it eliminates all the reasons for those denominational divisions made by men based on their rules for water baptism. Now, all of the denominations will argue that their perspective is right, backed by Scripture, yet all of them have to go contrary to what Paul taught about baptism in order to require or support water baptism. Now, I don't want anybody to think that I'm against water baptism. I don't think it's a sin. If you want to get water baptized, then go do it. But know why you are doing it. We are each going to be judged for those things that we did while we were alive, so each of you need to do your best to follow what you believe God is convicting you of. God has a purpose for your life and you need to follow him. The danger with water baptism is that people are taught that they need to do it. And as a result, people may put their trust in that baptism, not in the work that Jesus did to pay for their sin. 
that is very dangerous. Additionally, baptism should never be a decision made from guilt based on the emotional words that a pastor says when he asks you to bow your head at the end of a service. Each baptism in the Bible is for a very specific reason and group of people. Just because you get baptized with someone else's baptism doesn't mean that you're part of that group. My desire for you is that you follow God's word and conviction to know why and what you are identifying yourself to in whatever baptism you believe God has called you to participate in. And that's going to conclude this week's study. But before you go, if you want to know how you can support the work that we do here, there are four easy ways. First, you can share our studies with those who you know who need the Word of God. You can also share them on all your social media platforms. Second is to like this video if you found the content helpful. Third is to subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. These three actions support the algorithms of YouTube to help the Word to go out. But the most important and biggest way that you can support this ministry is through prayer. James 5.16 says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. People need truth and your prayers can help, so please pray for this mission. If you have questions or would like to share your story, the best way to communicate with me is by email, which is tinylifebigmission at gmail.com. I simply ask that you remember our five guiding principles before reaching out. And that's all the time that we have for this week. I hope to see you next week in this word. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.